Today I'm going to talk about what the best college teachers know, and here is uh, the goals of what I'm going to try and, and talk to you about. So first, I'm going to propose that our entire approach to the practice, the study, and the training of teaching is completely misguided. Right? It's a pretty modest uh, uh, goal there. I'm going to say that it focuses too much on what teachers do and not enough on what teachers know. Right. Uh, I'm going to present a research-based framework uh, that Bill Serbin and I have developed to, to try and, and sort of shift uh, the, uh, the teaching and training of, uh, of psychology to a more constructive uh, path. And I'm trying to convince you that this is really the better way to think about, about teaching. So that's what this is all about. Now, I didn't just wake up this morning and think, I'm going to try and convince everyone that they've been teaching in the wrong way. I've been thinking about this for a long time. What's the best way to think about teaching, to characterize it, to train it, uh, uh, to, you know, future teachers? What is the most constructive way of, of, of doing this? And I started thinking about this contextual nature. We know that learning is contextual, so teaching has to be contextual, right? So back in um, 2008, we, we, I, I participated in the uh, blueprint, uh, what's called the blueprint, Blueprint Conference. It's the uh, National Conference on un the uh, Future of Undergraduate Education and Psychology. And I published uh, with uh, an, uh, another group uh, this contextual approach to teaching. This is my first sort of thought about contextual models of, of learning. So that was 2008. Then in 2017, I, I recognized that the way we were going about teaching it had just mired us uh, in, a, in a, just a sea of buzzwords. That, we, that teaching changes, it moves from fad to fad, but it never progresses, right? So we just live through fads. And so I published this uh, essay in Inside Higher Education with Bill Servin, uh, law, Teaching and Learning Lost in a Buzzword Wasteland. Also, I recognized that the way we think about teaching and the way we train teaching is really uh, really not constructive. And it's especially embarrassing for us being psychologists because we know about more about learning than anybody else. So we should be uh, at the very forefront. We shouldn't be teaching like every other field because we know more about this just in the course of our training. So uh, with a couple people here, with Missy and Jane, uh, we got together, ate a lot of barbecue in Austin, and, and then uh, put together this, uh, this article on uh, practice what we teach, improving teaching and learning in psychology, which is a much more, uh, it's it's a much more tame name than we called it uh, the, the beginning. It was our, our teaching manifesto. Uh, originally, we just couldn't uh, get that one past the the editor. Uh, then finally, in, or not finally, actually, in, in 2021. I, I came up with a model with Bill Serban, who's been my longtime collaborator uh, on this, uh, talking about the cognitive challenges of effective teaching. And I'm going to go over that uh, today as a better way of thinking about teaching than what, what we currently do. And then finally, just last week, um, STP, uh, once again, a, a, a great organization, published the ebook that's been a couple years in the making, uh, edited by uh, Catherine Overson and Victor Panassi. Some of you may know him, but just a, 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 a tremendous tremendous resource of, of really just the, the, some of the leading people in learning science. Uh, and this is my uh, chapter, The Culture of Teaching We Have versus The Culture of Teaching We Need. Uh, and this book is free for download. Okay, so it is free. And you will not find a better resource for teaching. Okay, so I er encourage you to go to STP and, and download that book. Uh, and to, uh, I'll also put this up at the end in case you, uh, in case you want to see this. But where I lay out this, this argument I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so let's talk about sort of the current uh, approach to teaching. So we can look at teaching as, as, as basically of three processes. What teachers know, okay, what teachers do, and what teachers accomplish, the goals. Okay, so what teachers know is uh, a combination of different knowledge. You need different kinds of knowledge to be a successful teacher. So there's disciplinary knowledge, which we get in graduate school, right? This is our knowledge of the field uh, of psychology and our, our specific subfield, right? But there's more knowledge than that is required uh, to be an effective teacher. You also need pedagogical content knowledge. Okay, this is knowledge about how students learn your field or learn our field. This is knowledge about knowing what's going to confuse them, what's going to trip them up, what's going to be conceptually difficult for them. Them. When do you have to slow down? When do you have to like spend extra time? When, you know, when can you anticipate misconceptions coming in and, and confusions, common confusions? And then lastly, how people learn. And this is you know, the, the basics of how people learn. And this is the part of where psychologists know more about this than, than anybody else. It takes a combination of these kinds of knowledge to be an effective teacher. Then we go to pedagogy. Oops. 
pedagogy, hit the wrong one, uh, which is like planning your, uh, you know, your course, uh, picking, you know, what uh, kind of pedagogy you want to use. Do you want to use uh, traditional lecture? Do you want to use collaborative learning, service learning, inner teaching, uh, you know, discovery learning, problem-based learning, you know, whatever kind of technique you want to use, you implement it, uh, and then you, you see how well it works. And then finally, there's the, the goals and the outcomes, what the, the, the students actually take away from your course. So traditionally, what we've been focusing on is what teachers do, right? So there is a, a very well-regarded book, a, a terrific book by Ken Bain called What the Best College Teachers Do, and I kind of made a play on that for this title, uh, for the title of, of this talk, where he talks about, ostensibly, based on the title, like, you know, what are the practices that the teachers do? Okay, and then AACNU has high impact practices, right? So things like you know apprenticeships, learning communities, uh, you know uh, undergraduate research. So these are the best practices. These are the practices you need to implement if you want to be an effective teacher, right? Then. Uh, before uh, SDP's uh, conference was called the, the uh, uh, Annual Conference on Teaching, it was actually called the Best Practices Conference. It was organized by Bill Hill, uh, and it was every year it was like best practices, uh, in this case for technology-enhanced teaching, best practices for general psychology, best practices for research methods, and I actually edited one of the volumes here and I contributed to another, but there was also an emphasis on best practices, right? Um, then uh, Bill Buskist and Jared Keeley have the teacher behavior checklist, which is a checklist of what the best teachers do. It's like you check this list off and you must be a good teacher, right? And then, um, you know, we have student-centered versus teacher-instructor-centered uh, uh, instruction. This is an idea that goes back at least to Bill McKeechee back in the, in the 1960s, but it's still focused on, is this practice focused on what the teacher is doing or what the student is, uh, is doing? Then finally, something that's been getting a lot of attention is, is Rosenshine's Principles of Instruction. You may have heard of this, uh, where he talks about, you know, always give feedback and, you know, always provide examples. Uh, they say principles, but really it's practices, okay? So we're really focusing on best practices, what teachers do. And basically, I think this is a false promise. I think this is part of our, our problem. Uh, so here are a list of about 100 best practices at one time or another. So this list was generated by me and, and a few other people in under 10 minutes of all the practices we could think of that at one time or another have been promoted as being the best practice. This is going to revolutionize you know, teaching, right? So uh, what happens then is like this is introduced, it comes with a big splash, everyone's excited about it, everyone thinks it's gonna be the magic bullet, and then you know, after a while there's like some, some doubt, there's some, question, there's some results that don't support it, and then it kind of falls out of favor, uh, oftentimes leaving no trace whatsoever. Okay, it didn't advance the field at all. That's what I mean, teaching is fad, or, uh, fad driven. It changes, but it doesn't progress. Right? How many of you remember MOOCs? Remember MOOCs? Okay, whatever happened to MOOCs? They were going to revolutionize psychology. Remember Prezi? Okay, <laughs> whatever happened to Prezi? You know, the only presentation software where you need to take a Dramamine before you actually <laughs> sit before you know, a, a presentation, right? So those kind of disappear without the trace. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when PowerPoint came out, PowerPoint was going to revolutionize you know, the teaching of, of psychology, right? So it's become standard, but you know, it hasn't revolutionized psychology. If you go back far enough, you know, motion pictures were going to, to and, and radio was going to revolutionize uh, teaching, okay? So the best practice is a false uh, pr uh, premise because it's based on a faulty assumption. And that is, if you implement this, if you have a best practice and you implement this, this will always lead to student learning. All you have to do is implement it correctly no matter what the situation, no matter what the context, and this is because of the best practice, students are going to learn no matter what. And we know that that's not, that's not true. Okay? All right. And that is because learning is contextual. Right? So the best practice actually depends on the learning uh, context you're in. Right? So there is no such thing as a best practice that is best for all uh, students in, in all situations. What works best uh, at my college may not work at a, at a community college, which may not work at an R1 university, which may not work at an open uh, enrollment university. Right? So it's, it's counterproductive to talk about a, a best practice. Okay? 
every, uh, every, actually every class that we have has its own unique character. Okay, as teachers we know, that you know, we may have a, a section of general psych at eight o'clock and the, the activity we did there goes over great and then at nine o'clock it just falls flat, right? You know, each class is a very different characteristic. One class is very talkative, the other class just sits there looking at their phones. You know, so you, know, you have to adapt to the situation. So it, it doesn't make sense to talk about best practices. Furthermore, you know, every uh, practice can be implemented badly or inappropriately, right? So you can give terrible feedback and it actually hurts learning. You can give great feedback and it helps learning. You can give terrible formative assessments and it hurts learning. You can give great formative assessments, right? So just talking about like, here's a best practice, you do it, and all of a sudden you're, you're, and your students will automatically learn is just, is just false, okay? All right, so. Um, just to, to kind of illustrate this uh, in another way, okay, this is the way we study learning. We look at it like one factor, maybe, or two factors, metacognition, growth mindset, you know, transfer. So that's how we, we study it as researchers, that's how we, we learn it as teachers, and this is what teaching is like, right? <laughs> so it is this constant adaptation, it's this constant assessment, and, and that's actually what, um, what uh, Ken Bain found in his book, is that the best teachers are constantly adapting, they're assessing, they're adapting, they are shifting on the fly. Right, and there, there's nothing you know, like best practices in what they were doing. Um, here are some quotes from, from, from uh, Bain's book. Teaching is creating those situations in which most, not all of our students will realize their potential to learn. Okay, so he's not talking about best practice, he's trying to create an atmosphere that supports learning. And he says, we don't need routine experts who know all the procedures, but adaptive ones who can uh, apply the fundamental principles to all situations and students they're likely to encounter recognize there is no single best way to teach. Okay, so actually I think he misnamed his book. Uh, it shouldn't be the best, you know, what the best college teachers do. It should be what the best college teachers know how to do, right? Okay, because he's talking about having the knowledge of, of being able to assess when you're being successful, when you're not being successful, and, and, and changing on the fly. Okay, so what's a better way of thinking about teaching than best practices? I suggest uh, that it's, we, we think about it in terms of cognitive challenges. Okay, these are the challenges that all teachers must negotiate and all students must negotiate as well. So this is contextual because how one person solves it may be different from how another person solves it. You know, quite literally, you know, how I solve the problem may be different from how the person in the office next to me solves the problem. Right, and to call like you know one of them best practice and the other one not doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Okay, so let's talk about it in terms of the cognitive challenges that we all have to face, we all have to negotiate, and let's talk about how you know different approaches that we can uh, we can develop to address each challenge. Right, and then you know when we teach, we'll have a, a, just a, a set of, of uh, procedures that we can use, and if this one doesn't work, we can shift to Plan B, and if this doesn't work, we can, we can shift to Plan C. And about you know this point of the semester, I think we're all on like Plan R or Plan S, right? Okay, so we're always adapting. Okay, so a good teacher knows multiple strategies for solving a particular problem, we get a particular challenge. A good teacher knows the optimal way to implement a pedagogy to address specific challenges, uh, op implement it optimally for the situation that they're in, for the students that they have. Okay, so here are uh, uh, the, the nine cognitive challenges that, that, that uh, I uh, have, have kind of created. They're, these are categories. They summarize, uh, like, you know, uh, pedagogical research into these nine categories, right? I'm going to explain them. I'm going to break it down into a little uh, uh, sort of easier to understand uh, 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 sort of scheme in a, in a second here, but what's really critical here is that these all interact with each other. Okay, so these challenges are constantly interacting. So what I'm arguing for here is that teaching is managing a nine-way interaction. Okay, <laughs> teaching is incredibly complex. A good teacher is an incredibly skilled person. You know, it's not just like you use uh, inter-teaching and you're automatically a good teacher, right? You are learning, you're constantly learning. Teaching is a, is a lifelong uh, uh, sort of skill that you have to develop and it should start in graduate school. Right about training effective teaching uh, techniques. Okay, so nine is is uh, is a lot. So, uh, Bill. Uh 
uh, Serban uh, uh, broke it down into four categories. And um, I can't take credit for these nice slides. Missy Beers uh, did with you, uh, came up with these. Any, any slide I have up that's aesthetically pleasing, that's Missy. Anything that looks like a, like a two-year-old did it, that's, that's me. Okay, all right. So we start with what students believe. Okay, so mental mindset, the attitudes and beliefs that students have coming into our class, right? So are they predisposed to like it? Are they curious about it? Do they think that they're already bad at it, right? Do they think that they can succeed with, with sufficient effort, right? Fear and mistrust. Uh, students often think that, that uh, you know, our job here is to, to, is to kick out the students who aren't worthy of being there. So they don't trust us. They already see us as being their enemy. They see us as being an obstacle that they've got to get by. Right? Uh, and metacognition and self regulation. Metacognition is your awareness of your own thought processes, and this has to do with your awareness of, of how much you really understand um, uh, the concept. So, what students believe, what students know. Okay, this has to do with misconceptions. Uh, students come to us with misconceptions. It's just rife in psychology, right? We have all these misconceptions uh, that, that students come in with, and it's really difficult to change those misconceptions. And I'll give you an example a little later on. Prior knowledge, uh, the, the biggest uh, predictor of how well you learn something is how much you already know about it. Uh, so the more you know, the, the, the easier it is to learn. Uh, transfer of learning, which is uh, obviously what we're, we're hoping to achieve, where students won't just simply forget about what we teach them, but they will use the information appropriately uh, you know, beyond our classroom, and they'll remember what, we, what they've learned. Okay, and that's an incredibly difficult challenge uh, as well. Students often look at courses as something to be completed and then never thought of again, right? Okay, uh, what students can do, this has to do with, with cognitive constraints, uh, constraints of selective attention, we're terrible at multitasking, uh, and constraints of mental effort and, and working memory. Mental effort is a, is a resource limitation, uh, concentration, and then working memory is a capacity limitation. They're, they're linked in, in some way, but you can think about it as either a limitation of resource or a limitation in, uh, in capacity. Okay, and then finally, how students learn, uh, ineffective learning strategies, students uh, uh, prefer the least effective learning strategies because uh, they're easy to do. Uh, they're not effective, but that's not their concern. They just want to get through their study session as, uh, with as list, little effort as possible. Uh, and then metacognition self-regulation again, but this uh, time we're focusing on self-regulation, uh, which is regulating their own, their own learning. Okay, so let's talk about each of, uh, of, of these categories in more detail uh, and talk about like how they manifest themselves in our classes uh, and the kinds of, of, um, of strategies that we can use to try and address them. Okay, so we're gonna start with what students believe. Okay, so we've got a, a, a typical large classroom here and you've got students with different thoughts here. So this student is thinking, you know, I don't like this stuff, I'm bad at it and it's pointless. Okay, I'm only in here because it's required and I'm really going to just do the minimal amount to get a passing grade and I'll never think about it again. Okay, so that's an attitude that's obviously not going to lend itself to you know, critical thinking, right? And so we can't just present information. We've got to try and change and address that attitude, right? Okay, uh, another student is thinking this is where they weed out the people who don't belong. This is a gatekeeper course. This is where they find the people who don't belong here uh, and they kick them out. Okay, another person's like, I already know all this stuff. Okay, for right or, or wrong, we uh, have students who are, who are grossly overconfident, right? Uh, so this is student mental mindset, uh, where you know the, they have an attitude and belief, and we need to to address that mindset if we want to have students learn successfully. It doesn't have anything to do with our knowledge of our field. It has to do with understanding the attitudes that students come in with and trying to change that. And once again, who's better at persuasion and changing attitudes than psychologists are, right? So we have another advantage there. This is student fear and mistrust, right? They think that you're the enemy, right? And then this is metacognition. This is understanding, uh, you know, uh, awareness of your own level of understanding or not being aware of your own level of understanding. Okay, so for student mental mindset, the kind of mindset we really need to, uh, to promote 
is something like, like this. Uh, this is uh, uh, Camille Farrington's work on uh, productive persistence. She said, if, if students have these four beliefs, then they will persist through challenges and setbacks. So we need to promote these kinds of beliefs. So number one, I belong in this academic community. Number two, my ability and competence grow with my effort. Uh, I can succeed at this, and then this work has value for me. We need to really set this up, even before the semester begins, uh, by like sending out that welcome message or posting that syllabus that is welcoming and is supportive uh, of, you know, of, the, of the class, right? So as psychologists, we know that the first one is belongingness, which is receiving a lot of attention uh, right now. Jeffrey Cohen just published a book on, on belongingness interventions. Uh, the second one is growth mindset. Uh, Carol Dweck's work, a lot of you are already familiar with this, uh, the idea that you can succeed through your own efforts. Uh, then academic self-efficacy, that I have the ability uh, to succeed if I put forth the effort. And the last one, the work having value for me. So we tend to take that for granted because, of course, it's interesting to us uh, already, but, um, uh, but uh, students don't automatically uh, uh, think so. All right? And uh, there is growing evidence that the teacher's mindset is just as important as the student's mindset. So if you believe in a fixed mindset that some students are worthy and some students are not, then that's really going to hurt those students who are, who are like ill-prepared but are capable. You know, they're going to see this as, as, as being you know, not worth trying if you've already like, passed judgment uh, on them. Right? So we have to be very careful about the mindset our, the, our own mindset that, that, uh, that we project uh, there. Okay. Now, something about uh, another aspect of mindset that, that uh, I've been thinking about a lot lately is curiosity. Curiosity is a, is a personality trait, but it's also a state that we can create. Okay. And um, if you don't have curiosity, it's like eating when you're already full. Right? So there's not a lot of motivation, but if you create curiosity as a mindset, I really care about this stuff, then that's really going to be helpful to you. You, you, you sort of uh, have students recognize that there is something that they don't know or something that they don't understand adequately, and it is important for them to fill that gap. Uh, and you uh, have them use uh, effective learning strategies so they remember this, uh, and you are a trustworthy source of information so that next time this comes up, you will they will remember that, that you, know, you said this uh, and you are really a very uh, trustworthy source of information. Okay. And then uh, there's student trust in the teacher. This is something that uh, I've been working on uh, a lot uh, with uh, my colleague Jack, Jack Berry. Uh, and trust is, is actually an, an incredibly important uh, uh, component of, of, for student motivation and student perseverance. Uh, and there's actually not a lot of research uh, on this. So this is how we define trust, students' willingness to risk vulnerability and pursue challenging work. Okay, do the belief that the teacher is competent, demonstrates integrity, will act in ways that are beneficial to the student's learning, All right? So this is a judgment on the student's part about your intentions, okay, about your ability and what you're trying to accomplish. If they see you as being competent, they see you as being uh, having integrity, of, of treating them with dignity and respect, uh, as seeing them as, as humans, uh, you know, and, and then also uh, being on their side as being advocates for their learning, they will work harder for you. They will take on greater challenges. They will persist longer for you. They will, you know, perceive, persevere through, through setbacks, right? So this is in, in, incredibly important to, to kind of create this sense of, of student trust. And it can be violated uh, uh, just unintentionally, just, you know, if they see that you're, you're playing favorites, uh, certain classes or, or, you know, or certain majors, certain students, uh, if you make a disparaging remark about certain groups, uh, you can violate that trust and, and that has, has huge negative consequences. So one way of, of increasing trust is through what's called wise feedback. This is David Yeager's work at the University of Texas. Texas. Uh, just imagine uh, if uh, you know you, you fail a student, and then of course you write, "Please see me." You know, do they ever come and see you? No, well, probably not, right? But if you cite, uh, your paper contains a number of errors that are easily correctable. I see you're using some inefficient strategies and some of these problems. Please come to my office, and we can go over this. And I think I can really help you with this. Are they more likely to see you uh, in that way? Right. It's called wise feedback, and, and it, it has three components to it. Uh, it, you know, I'm holding the whole class to high standards. In other words, I'm not singling you out uh, for criticism. Right. 
I, you have the ability to reach those standards, and I'll provide you with the, the with the resources you need. Right. So as long you you know you you communicate those three aspects of wise feedback, uh, it is is you know the students will be much more likely to trust you and to come and see you. Uh, and this is works especially well with uh, minoritized students, uh, African American students, uh, in in predominantly white uh, institutions. So this is a, a really powerful way of, of gaining trust. Okay, so just to recap, student mental mindset, it's the student beliefs and attitudes they have. You need to uh, explain the value of the work. Uh, you need to promote belongingness and productive persistence. Okay, fear and mistrust, uh, acknowledge those fears. You know, I teach statistics, so the first thing I do is, is I say, you know, I know no one becomes a psych major in order to take statistics and, and research methods. You know, so I, I said, you know, I know you're, you're uncomfortable being here, but really, this is a really valuable course, and, you know, it, it'll be a positive experience for you. Okay, uh, and then... Um, uh, Meta, uh, so metacognition, uh, I didn't really talk about this one, provide ample feedback opportunities and show them how to use that feedback. Because students don't necessarily know what to make of the feedback that they, uh, that they get. And you have to kind of say, if you did this, then you really need to like, study this more or, or, and things like that. Okay, so moving on to what students know, using knowledge. All right, so here we have uh, a general psych class at a large university looking at the, uh, an image of the brain, a multicolor image of the brain, and someone says, oh yeah, I remember this from AP Psych. They already have gone over this once. Whereas another student is going, oh, so that's what a brain looks like. You know, they don't even really, they've never seen one before, this is all new to them, right? Another person is saying, I hope we learn about left brain and right brain people, okay? And then the fourth, uh, another one is going, oh, so that's why my grandfather's paralyzed on the left side, after his stroke damage his right frontal lobe, right? We, uh, you know, one of these days I'm going to have a student like that, but uh, <laughs> it's, you know, hopefully, let's, let's say it's, uh, you actually have one that's there. So this is prior knowledge, right? So uh, oftentimes our, our students come to us with different levels of prior knowledge. For some, it's a rehash of things they've already had before. Others, it's brand new. And we don't want to punish those people who've never had it before, okay? Uh, we want to uh, sort of provide the support that, will, that can bring them up to up to speed. We don't want our exam or we don't want our grades to reflect prior knowledge instead of what they're actually capable of, of, of learning in the in the, the course of our of, of our classes. Right. Uh, this is misconceptions uh, that students bring with them, uh, and this is transfer of learning, which is incredibly difficult to uh, to do. Right. Okay. So let's talk a bit about, about the importance of prior knowledge and how it has an effect. Uh, there's this YouTube channel, this professional poker player uh, named uh, Brad Owen, and I just really like listening to him, even though I don't play uh, Texas Hold'em. But this is, you know, I, I, I uh, sort of just took this transcript. You know, I got a king five suit in a big blind, there's a straddle on the button, then raise it to 40, I call for 30 more, the under the gun calls, and we're going three ways to the flop, it's jack, six, four, rainbow. What in the world does that mean? Okay, so, you know, if you know poker, I think it makes sense, you know, it makes sense to him, right? But if you don't have that prior knowledge, you, you can't understand what's going on. And that's what it's like for our students who've never had psychology before, sitting in introduction psychology class, right? So we think it's really clear, okay, but if they don't have the prior knowledge, then they don't know what's, what's going on. So that's, that's the importance of, of prior knowledge, okay? All right, so that's prior knowledge. Now, here is, is tenacious misconceptions. So this is a, an example from uh, Carl Wyman, uh, or Carl Wyman, who uh, is a physicist, uh, who uh, has, he won the Nobel Prize and he donated uh, the prize to set up uh, uh, a foundation to improve science education. So, you know, the sound of the violin, all right, the sound of the violin, it turns out, is not caused by the strings, it's actually caused mostly by the vibration of the wood in the back. Uh, of the violin, uh, the violin. People think that it's the strings. So uh, he gave this lecture where he said, you know, uh, the sound of violin is not mainly from the strings, it's actually from the vibration of the, the wood in the back. 15 minutes later, he gave a concept test uh, which asked, you know, what causes the sound you hear from a violin? 84% still said it's mostly by the strings. <laughs> okay, 15 minutes prior, he had, he had like, given them the correct answer. Okay, because the students, you know, already knew that and they didn't really feel like they needed to modify that because it's something they, they were already sure about. Right? So think of all the misconceptions that students come in with uh, in our psychology classes. Okay, so insufficient prior knowledge, 
you've got to find a way uh, to build up that, that prior knowledge, to give the students who don't have a background a chance to catch up. And one of the, one of the sort of silver linings from the pandemic is that we all have recorded lectures now uh, uh, that, that we can like post and, and give those students a chance to kind of go over them, uh, it, but they have to use them correctly. Now I'm finding that most of my students, they use them while, you know, they play them at twice speed as they're driving through Starbucks. And, you know, like I said, I listened to it five times. I don't know why I didn't do well on the exam. So you have to, you know, that, that gets to in, in, ineffective learning strategies, which we'll, we'll talk about a little, a little later. But give them ways of, of, of catching up. Uh, uh, Bill uh, Serban really likes practice quizzes to help them to do that, to really focus on what they don't know and help them to catch up. Misconceptions, uh, it's incredibly difficult to correct misconceptions, uh, but, you know, you need to have refutational teaching where you raise this misconception and then you uh, and then you refute it, and uh, if this happens across like multiple courses, you're more likely to correct uh, the, the misconception there. And then transfer of learning, being very intentional, uh, giving students opportunities to apply the knowledge in different contexts, right? So not just teaching it once, but actually using different uh, 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 formative assessments to kind of make sure that they think about this in, uh, across other uh, situations that are relevant to them. Okay. So what students can do, recognizing constraints. So here is a class looking at the world's worst PowerPoint slide, right? Okay, so uh, this person is going, where am I supposed to be looking? All right, because they're not even sure like where they're supposed to pay attention because the, the speaker, the, the, the lecturer is speaking and there's so much information here, they have no idea where they're supposed to be looking and you know, the chances are they're not looking in the right place, right? Then, like, I can't keep up with everything he's saying, so this is um, just simply, like, there's too many pieces of information for me to keep track of here. Uh, and then this other person is like, I've overwhelmed, I, I give up. Uh, this is too much for me to concentrate uh, on, right? So this is uh, the constraint of selective attention, right? So that we can uh, only pay attention to sort of one focus uh, at a time, okay? Uh, then this is the constraint of mental effort and working memory. Uh, so one of them is uh, uh, the, uh, this is like uh, working memory, this is the number of items you can keep, which is about, about four, uh, and then uh, I'm overwhelmed, this is like the, the limit of, of uh, mental effort or concentration. You can, like I say, you can think of it as a, as a, con as a constraint on the number of items, you can think of it a constraint as, as, a, as a mental resource. Uh, uh, you know, e either way, it's a major uh, constraint on learning. Okay, so often Oftentimes we forget about the constraint of selective attention and we create our own conflicts within the classroom. All right? So I always uh, will go and, and watch new instructors teach and give them feedback when, they, when they, uh, I uh, hired them. And so it's very typical to have a, 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 a teacher saying stuff over here while the PowerPoint has different information over here. And you're creating like uh, you know, an example of, of, of multitasking. And of course, what do students do as soon as a new PowerPoint slide goes up? They just start writing it, writing it down. They're not paying attention to what you're saying, right? So what you need to do is learn to like blank things out, you know, while you're talking. You know, you've, you've got to be aware of, of where the student's attention is. And sometimes you've got to stop and regather it together. But there should always be a single focus of attention within your, within your classroom, right? Uh, good teaching involves attention management, knowing where the student's attention are at any given time. Okay. All right. So let's talk about mental effort because this is something that, that uh, teachers oftentimes don't um, uh, understand uh, adequately. Okay, so this is, has to do with, with mental effort and cognitive load. So mental effort is concentration, and it's a limited resource. We only have a limited amount of it. Cognitive load is the amount of, of mental effort uh, that a task takes, right? So there's always an available, limited amount of mental effort available to our students, right? And it varies depending on how tired they are or you know how sleep deprived they are, if they've had an energy drink right before class and, and things like that. Now. 
teaching involves different kinds of cognitive load. Intrinsic load is the amount of, of uh, mental effort required to understand a concept. Nothing you can do about it. Some concepts are more difficult to understand than others. If you're just trying to like define a simple term, you know that is relatively simple, but if, you, if it's a complex term like statistical significance, which depends on understanding other terms like probability and decision making and type one and type two errors, that's, that's a high cognitive load uh, uh, a term there. So that's intrinsic load. Nothing you can do about that. That's the mental effort it takes to understand the concept. This is the germane load. This is the load that's, that's, um, uh, that's required uh, from the pedagogy you choose. Okay. So one of the advantages of lecturing actually is it has relatively low cognitive load because the student is sitting there and can concentrate. If you use service learning where they're in a new situation, they've got to have to learn like what's going on in this, you know, in this situation. Like you send them to a, a retirement center to interview you know, elderly people, they've got to know, like, you know, they're in this new situation, they've got to meet these new people, that's taking load, okay, that's your main load. And then extraneous load is uh, load that's caused by any other kind of distraction, stuff that's going on that's not related uh, to uh, the task at all. So, like, these are the, the jokes you tell, uh, the, the, the cute uh, memes you have, and, and, and other things like that. So, the combined cognitive load of your teaching has to be less than uh, the available mental effort, okay? And if it if is not less, if, if the combined cognitive load of teaching is greater than the available mental effort, your students will be overwhelmed and they're not gonna learn anything, okay? So you've always gotta be aware of the cognitive load uh, of, of your students. And it's uh, easy for us to forget what this is like because we've been devote, we've devoted our lives to studying our topic and it's automatic for us and we forget what it's like to learn something for the first time. It's called the curse of expertise, right? So we're gonna do, this is the, this is the uh, uh, audience participation part of the talk. Okay, uh, I'm going to have you name the days of the week out loud and in order as fast as you can. And I'm gonna make you a bet that you can't do it uh, in under 10 seconds. I'm gonna bet you an order of beignets at Cafe Du Monde that you cannot do it in under 10 seconds. Ready? You ready, you with me? Everybody together, ready, set, go. No, 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 in alphabetical order. Okay, all right. So, you know, days of the week in alphabetical order. Ready, set, go. Okay, I guess I'm eating a lot of beignets tonight. Yeah. So. All right. Did you did did you, those of you tried it? Did you feel like wow, that was that was really tough, right? This was you know you really had to think about it. I saw a lot of eyes go go heavenward here, right? And you really think about it. that's what it's like to be overwhelmed, to have like a lot of of cognitive load uh, that you're dealing with. Right? So, and we forget what that, that's what our students uh, experience the first time they see concepts that we, we teach. It is incredibly effortful for them to, to, to try and, and, and learn that, right? So it's really important for us to recognize uh, the, the limits of our student learning in terms of, of cognitive load. All right, so let me ask you about this activity. So, uh, okay, well let me ask, so like some of you I'm willing to bet said, well, I'm not doing that, okay? That's just, I don't see the point in doing that, so I'm not even gonna try. Okay. How many times have your students asked you, like, why are we doing this? You know, is this worthwhile? Like, this is effortful, this, and effort is unpleasant. You've gotta give them a justification for doing this. If, you, you know, if they think this is a hoop jumping exercise, they're not gonna engage in this, right? It's gonna be like minimal effort to get, to get by. So you've gotta establish that, that value. All right, so for those of you who actually did this, were you engaged? Were you active? Sure. Were you practicing retrieval? Yeah, you were like like Friday starts. Uh, were you working hard and you're struggling? Great. What was the fourth day in the list? Thursday. Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. All right. Now you're actually doing all the things. You were doing all the things that traditionally we were told lead to good learning, right? Active learning, retrieval practice, right? But if you are suffering, you know, major mental effort or major cognitive load, you're not gonna learn, right? So we've gotta pay attention to cognitive load. All right, so just a, a reminder of, of selective attention and um, uh, mental uh, effort and working memory. 
so always have one clearly defined focus and present information in a manageable, coherent uh, chunks to promote student reflection. All right, finally, I'm gonna go through this in just a few minutes, leave some time for, for questions. Uh, you know, this is another classroom. Okay, you've got an exam coming up, right? And, uh, you know, this person's like, I'll retype my lecture notes, read them over a few times, and that, that'll be, you know, that'll be sufficient. Okay, another person's going, oh, I'll block out the day before the exam study. So students come in thinking, you know, studying for an exam, you stay the, the, the day before, a really tough exam, you study two days before, right? <laughs> Okay, and then another person is going, I have three exams that day, what can I do? I'll just study for all of them whenever I have the time. Okay, so ineffective study strategies. All right, uh, and then uh, this is poor self-regulation where they don't plan well enough ahead to kind of make sure they have adequate uh, time to, to study and they don't sort of uh, use self-assessment to try and understand if they, uh, they study well enough. Um, so uh, we know that students prefer the least uh, effective study strategies even in the face of contradictory evidence. This is a uh, well-known study by uh, uh, Jeffrey Karpicki and, and, uh, uh, and Blunt where they um, had students uh, you know, use different strategies uh, for learning and retrieval practice. Uh, was the, uh, the, the best in terms of, of learning, but then when they ask students, like, which one do you think is best, they think that the repeated study is going to be the most effective one. And this is very resistant to change. Uh, you know, students did better in retrieval practice. They, they attributed to things like, well, I just guessed, uh, you know, I was lucky that time. Right? They, they don't want to give up the fact that, re, you know, retrieval practice may be a, a better way of, of, of learning. Okay. Now, it really makes sense to teach your students how to learn, teach them good study strategies, and uh, we have a resource for that. Guy Boyson and I created a, a, a teaching uh, a, a study skills module, part of, of APA Introductory Psychology Initiative, uh, which we heard learned about this morning, uh, right? And it is free for download. It includes uh, like notes, it includes PowerPoint slides, or Google slides actually. It includes assessments and concept checks. It's a, it's a complete uh, thing. So you can use this uh, as a basis for teaching your students how to study. Okay, so ineffective learning strategies. Students use ineffective learning strategies because they're easy to do rather than being effective. Uh, so you need to model those, those, uh, those strategies. Like we are using retrieval practice here, which is a really good way to study. And then, you know, we covered this last week, but it's good to, to space out our, 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 uh, our studying. You need to model those, those strategies for students as well as telling them about it. And self-regulation, you need to uh, uh, give them structure in terms, especially first year students, about how to, to uh, structure their, their study time. Okay. All right. So these are the cognitive challenges of, of teaching, right? And I think it makes more sense to think about our teaching in terms of these challenges that we have to negotiate, that we have to work with students as partners to try and overcome uh, in order to try to like, stick to a best practice. Because best practices have not led to uh, really uh, progress in terms of, of improving teaching. Okay, so these are our challenges, All right? So this is my take home message for you, okay? Uh, we need to get away from this idea that practice uh, is pedagogy. You know, I use inter, uh, you know, service learning and that's my pedagogy. That's not pedagogy. The best practice is, approach is misguided. Pedagogy is theory-driven practice to achieve a learning goal. So you've got to have a goal in mind, like one of the challenges uh, that, that we're trying to negotiate. Okay, uh, and then, uh, or actually, uh, like the ones that there were, are outlined this morning in APA, the, the, there's, that's a lot of letters there. The APA, IPI, SLOs. <laughs> Uh, so, American Psychological Association, Introductory Psychology Initiative, Student Learning Outcomes, the APA, IPI, SLOs, they're, they're laid out for you. Like, the, here is like the, a place to, uh, a well-established place to start. So start with your uh, learning outcomes you want, oops, and then, uh, you know, think about them in terms of cognitive challenges that you need to overcome. Select and implement your pedagogy to address the challenges for your academic con uh, context. So formative assessments, examples, feedback, interventions. A lot of times people use clicker questions without really knowing why. Uh, it's like they, they've heard it's a kind of a good idea, that there's something that good teachers do. 
But here, what you need to do is like, I'm using this clicker question to address misconceptions. I'm using this clicker question to address you know, metacognition. And of course, you could, it can be more than one goal at a time, but when you design pedagogy, you should have a learning goal in mind, right? Okay, and then uh, you assess and you adapt. So teaching is this constant cycling of planning, uh, uh, assessing, and adapting. Okay, uh, here is that, uh, uh, that ebook that, that I hope you all take advantage of. It, it's just this, I mean, uh, uh, the, the irony of this is that it suffers because it's free. If it was like 40 bucks on Amazon, people would buy it. But the fact that it's free, people t tend to, uh, to ignore it. This is the second one in the series. The, the previous one was in 2014, and, and I think it kind of got uh, overlooked because uh, it, it, it was a, a free download, but it's like, the, the, you know, the, the, some of the best people in, the, in learning science. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Be happy to answer any questions that you have. Two minutes.